Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, Elise, thank you for that very kind introduction, and thank you to the Churchwell family for inviting me to speak today. It's an honor to be part of this event. The sacrifices Robert Churchwell made so he could make a living and raise a family here in Nashville are very difficult for us to imagine here in the year 2015, but they were all too real. Mr. Churchwell was an African-American man who went to work for a white-owned newspaper in 1950, a decade before the Civil Rights Movement took flight on this very streets that surround this building. For his first five years at the Nashville Banner, Mr. Churchwell was not allowed uh, to work in the newsroom. While his white colleagues worked together every day celebrating their successes as a team and le leaning on each other when times were tough, he was forced to work at home all alone. After he finally got his own desk at the Banner Newsroom in 1955, Mr. Churchwell was still shunned by many of his white colleagues. Now remember, this was a man who had served his country in World War II, a man who was part of the greatest generation, but that typically uh, didn't matter, unfortunately, if you were a black man returning to civilian life in the Jim Crow South of the 1940s and the 1950s. A lesser man wouldn't have lasted very long in that environment. A weaker man would have given up. But Mr. Churchill kept going, uh, just like the more famous pioneer he's been compared to, uh, baseball player Jackie Robinson. Mr. Churchwell persevered, continuing to work at the Banner until 1981, outlasting many of his fellow reporters and editors. And although he's no longer with us today, his legacy uh, lives on in newsrooms throughout the South. His legacy also lives here in Nashville, which is one of the primary battlegrounds of the Civil Rights Movement. Now, more than 50 years later, our city is known as one of the most welcoming cities in the country, a place where people of all races and nationalities and creeds can live and raise their families and start businesses. President Obama even came here last fall to celebrate the way our city works with immigrants to make them feel at home. We have a lot uh, to thank Mr. Churchwell for, his courage, his commitment, his very accomplished family, and of course, his example. Metro Nashville Public Schools named an elementary school for Mr. Churchwell in 2010. And now it's great to see that there's a children's book set in, the, in that school, a story in which the main character, a young girl who's struggling after moving to Nashville, learns why that name is there and what it means. I hope that story uh, will come true over and over in the years ahead for the children who enroll at Robert Churchwell Elementary School. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Dean. Those fabulous words. I, I was um, sitting, my name's Kevin Churchwell, and I'm a glorious husband. That's what I call myself at these occasions. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was thinking uh, through Mayor Dean's comments, um, and they described uh, my dad, our dad, uh, in, I think, uh, really true terms. And my thought was, well, what else can I say and so I want to really try to give you as a sense of uh, Robert Churchwell as a man uh, and what we thought of him uh, in terms of his life. And it sort of hit me uh, in the presentation in terms of what the public library is doing, uh, uh, honoring superheroes. And I will tell you, uh, the kids in the household felt that our dad was a superhero. And let me tell you why. Robert Churchwell was born in 1917. So he, was, uh, he saw the entire 20th century, and he lived it, and he, was, he and was part of it. So he was born in 1917 at the end of World War I and lived through the Great Depression. Uh, his family uh, moved from Clifton, Tennessee to Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, set their roots here in Nashville. And in the Great Depression, they experienced all of it. Uh, and those that remember the Great Depression, uh, there was not another time in the United States like it in terms of the devastation, the poverty, just the poorness of people. And his family had to survive in that, and he helped his family survive. He then went from the, the Great Depression to uh, World War II 
and was drafted. And he always said he had the honor, he described it an honor in quotes, of serving in both theaters of the war, the European theater and the Pacific theater. And uh, when you think about it, that really changed his life. You know, uh, you, you, you have opportunities at times to, uh, to, to make a difference or have a difference that really affects you. And I believe uh, that uh, being drafted in the Army and having to go out from Nashville really changed him. It changed him from the idea that he got to see other parts of this country. He, uh, of course, uh, did his first part uh, in basic training in the Army elsewhere. And uh, during that time, he continued to develop his writing skills. He described that uh, in, in the camps, there was a difference between uh, what the African-American soldiers were experiencing and the white soldiers were experiencing in terms of food, in terms of housing, and all, on all the different issues. And he was the kind of guy that uh, sort of wouldn't let things lay. And he started writing letters. And he would start writing letters to his, uh, uh, to his superiors, complaining about uh, the issues that he saw in terms of food, in terms of housing, and et cetera. It got to the point that they just turned to him and said, Robert, would you please stop writing these letters? <laughs> But you can see that's where he started, you know, sort of his superhero -ness. you know, someone who was always willing to step into the breach and make a difference. So he's in World War II, and he gets to go to the European theater. And I think that was one of the big things that made a difference in his life, that he got to see London. He got to see France, Paris, and Germany. And he saw that there was a big world out there, and there was a difference and opportunity. He was then shipped over to the Philippines. Uh, and he didn't describe that as a great part of his life, but he got shipped over to the Philippines. He described uh, one of the best days of his life was uh, taking the train into Nashville and seeing Union Station and, being, and coming home. That was, he said that was one of the best days of his life. With the GI Bill, he went back to school and uh, went to Fisk University and Tennessee State University, majoring in English, always with that writing idea in his head. Uh, as an opportunity for him, journalism as an opportunity. He graduated and started his own businesses. And he started a business with a buddy of his, a buddy named Fred Booth, where they would go out and create community newspapers. They did it on their own. I think they had more than one that uh, sort of uh, success and failure, but they kept going and doing that. And with that, he was being recognized uh, in terms of uh, his writing skills and what he could offer. As Mayor Dean mentioned during that time in 1950, there was the beginning, just the start of the Civil Rights Movement, the start of a significant upheaval in uh, the United States. The National Banner recognized that uh, they had a problem uh, in 1950 and that they didn't have a lot of readership in the black community and felt what they had to do was bring a black reporter in to, to be that representative. So uh, they talked to community leaders of who, who should we ask, who could we pull uh, into the Nashville banner uh, to do this. Now you have to understand that there were two papers in Nashville at the time. There was a morning paper, the Tennessean, which is still here, and the Nashville banner, what was the evening paper. Two different types of paper, uh, papers. The Tennessean was more of a, what you would call a liberal paper. Uh, the banner was the conservative paper. It was the paper that you wouldn't think would be the paper that would recruit an African-American to write for them. It was a type of paper during that time that had at its front page articles comparing uh, African-Americans to monkeys, uh, as an example. But still, economics wins out. You know, we've got to sort of increase our, increase our readership. So they went to the community and said, who should we ask? And, they, and the community said, we've got somebody for you. We've got Robert Churchill. He should do this. And so the community leaders went to my dad and said, we want you to do this. This is important for you to do this. And you know what he said? No. <laughs> he said he wouldn't write for the banner ever. <laughs> but uh, there was perseverance by the community leaders, but most importantly, there was perseverance by his wife, Mary Churchwell, who uh, I think uh, t probably talked to him more than once and convinced him it was the right thing to do, it was important for him to do, it made a lot of sense for him to take this opportunity. So in 1950, he became the first African-American to write for a daily Southern newspaper, the Nashville Banner. He did that from, 19, from 1950 to 1981. And during that time, he saw the breadth 
of change in America. He saw the Korean War. He saw the Vietnam War. He saw the Civil Rights Movement and, and wrote about it. And you have to understand that he was a newspaper reporter. And he took that uh, responsibility extremely, uh, he took that as a very strong responsibility. It was very important to him that he write the news, dispassionate, report the news. And that's what he did. And he did that through the, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. The 70s here was a time of upheaval in Nashville in terms of desegregation. And he wrote about the busing, and he wrote about all the uh, changes in the public school system. And he became really the public, uh, beat writer, public school system beat writer uh, for the banner. So that gets us up to the 80s. Uh, he retired, and for him, retirement was that he just did, he decided to do a couple more jobs. <laughs> And uh, he became a uh, reporter and an editor for the uh, Nashville uh, Baptist Publishing Board and did that for another, I think, 20 years, almost 20 years before he officially retired because he just couldn't drive his car the way he liked it to get to work. <laughs> that was when he decided to retire. Robert Churchill died in uh, 19, I'm sorry, 2009 at the age of 91. So he had the chance to vote and see the first African-American president of the United States. So can you imagine that life, a life that started in 1917 and, and ended in 2009, the breath of incredible change in this country? So why do I consider him a superhero? Well, we saw him uh, as a man that was always there for us, a man that always had the answers, a man that uh, just made a difference every day in our lives. Someone who was just uh, a stalwart, who could do anything, who could make all the decisions, and all of them were the right decisions. When I look back on it, and I talk, my brother Robert's here, I think we talk about it a little bit now, that you know, he was a really sneaky kind of guy. Uh, that everything that he did was actually a, a learning opportunity for us. He was always teaching us uh, about how to be the right person, how to be a good person, how to be someone who can make a difference. If you go in, if you ever have a chance to visit my mom in her house, you'll go into our, uh, our library, and the library is full of books. And that was a big deal for him. He read most of them. But the key thing is, he made us read them too. <laughs> I remember my brother Keith and I outside playing tennis, and he would come outside and said, what are you doing out here? We said, well, we're playing tennis. And he said, no, you gotta come in and read. And at the time, you think about it and say, gosh, I got to come in and read. But now I think back on it and I say, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you for putting, instilling that into us. He loved reading. He loved literature. He loved the arts. He instilled that in all of us. And, I, and we have instilled that in our kids. I'll give you just, just one uh, story, and then I'll stop, Gloria. <laughs> uh, the guy was just an expert in movies. Uh, and what he would do when he was young, and this is in the 30s, he would actually go to the Tennessean. Who knows what I'm talking about when I say the Tennessean? There you go. The Tennessee Theater. Tennessee Theater used to be downtown. Huge theater, big balcony. African Americans couldn't sit in front, they had to sit in the balcony. But he would go all the time. So he knew all the movie stars of the 30s. And so we would be watching them. You know, there's Ted Turner, you know, the TNT movies now. We'd watch a movie from the 30s. And he'd say, oh, there's Victor McLaughlin. There's Alice Faye. He knew everybody. He knew everything. And he instilled that in us, his love of movies that transferred to our family, to uh, the brothers, and we've transferred to our kids. And I told our, uh, the kids that story because uh, when we drive around, they're talking about the movies of the day. And I said, you know, there's a legacy here. There's a legacy of understanding, of learning, of the arts, and it started with that man, Robert Churchwell. So the guy was a superhero. I think he almost had a cape and we would always try to search for it. <laughs> and I think Robert tried to, uh, Bobby tried to try it on a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> I would be remiss with not recognizing the other superhero in the family and his wife, Mary Churchwell, who at the age of 16, <laughs> who at the age of 16 left her home in Bell Boca, Tennessee and moved to Nashville, Tennessee on her own because she wanted to, more education. 
She wanted to go to high school. I couldn't imagine doing that today. But that's the strength that she provided, and that's the strength that she has pushed down uh, through, the, through the decades. So thanks, Mom, for everything. So that's Robert Churchwell, superhero, journalistic pioneer, and a lover of movies. I'm going to turn it now over to Gloria Resper Churchwell, my wife, and she's going to talk about her book, Robert Churchwell, Writing News, Making History, a Savannah Green Story. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And I want to thank Mayor Dean for coming today and also the Nashville Public Library, Elise Adler, um, our Diane Webb, who we love, um, Ms. Malone for all your support with the library. So we just, we just want to thank everyone for being here today and for you all to come and be here on a um, Saturday morning. It, this means a lot to us. It really does. It really does. So my job today is to talk to you a little bit about the book. And before I do that, we have another special guest in the house. And her name is Zoe Upkins, and she's actually our likeness for, the, um, for Savannah. She allows us to use her picture and to affect children throughout the world, because when they see this picture, they see someone who is lovable, a friend, or maybe they don't know her, but they want to be introduced to her. So I just wanted to recognize Zoe, if you can stand for us. Thank you for allowing us to use your likeness. <laughs> Thank you, Zoe. So let's start off here with our, as Dr. Churchwell, Kevin, talked about his dad, Robert Churchwell. Um, I knew Robert Churchwell, I've known him, I knew him for about 20 years, and it was five years after my being married to Kevin that I actually learned his full story. And once I learned his full story, I was just, as you, I'm sure some of you um, in learning his story, you were just amazed that this man could do so much and, and how he really was an important figure in American history. So with that information, I wanted to make sure, especially that the children, um, that they knew that there was such a man who lived. And in writing the book, Robert Churchwell, Writing News, Making History, A Savannah Green Story, I thought this was a good way to share his story with children especially. Now, the, the only, there were a few challenges, but the, the one that I can think of um, that really stands out was that I wanted to make sure that the children could associate with the man, you know, being that he was older and they were younger. How do you do that? And that's where our character, Savannah Green, comes in. She's a third grader, and just like Robert Churchwell, she faces challenges, but she's able to overcome those challenges. And she's able to utilize some of the things that Robert Churchwell did in his life to figure out how to make how to figure how to solve her problems, so I thought that was a good way to sort of tie the two together. Now is, and I apologize for the blurriness of this, but this was the actual cover of the, the uh, paper that came out in the Nashville Banner that announced Robert Churchwell's working for the Nashville Banner, and I wanted to read exactly what the little um, caption up here says because I think it's important that you that you know. During that time, in 1950, uh, what was said about his announcement, and it said, the Nashville Banner has employed a full-time Negro reporter on its staff to report the activities of the colored citizens of Nashville. This news appears daily in the Banner, along with other news. It is not segregated. This newspaper also is publishing all Negro death notices turned in by undertakers. Below are news items that have appeared recently in the banner. And this was dated February the 13th, 1950. Now this was an important, I just want to go back, because I wanted to say, even though this was a local event, this was a local event with national importance. That was very important, a local event with national importance. And for the children, I just wanted to just to just bring it a little bit closer to you to let you know what, what does that mean. In 1950, for this African-American man to work and write for the Nashville Banner that had never done this before, that was like, just imagine, the Tennessee Titans winning the Super Bowl. You know, that's, that's huge, right? It would be for us a national, a local event, but it would have national importance, right? 
And we know that with this wonderful quarterback that we have in, in Nashville now, that can happen, right? You agree with me on that one? And I'm sure the mayor would also agree with that. <laughs> also, we think about the local music that we have here. People think about Nashville, Music City, country music. It's local music with national importance. The third example that I feel is really important, as Mayor Dean talked about, the sit-ins in 1960s that started in um, North Carolina and traveled to Nashville, Tennessee. When those things were happening, they were local, but they were of national importance. And that was the same thing with Robert Churchwell work, uh, writing for the banner, being um, the first to do that. It was a local event, but it definitely had national importance. So that's why Again, we have the book, Robert Church, we're writing news of Savannah Green's story. Let's talk a little bit about the book. In the book, I, uh, there are three things in particular I wanted to make sure that I shared. And you heard that um, with Kevin as he talked about the education being so important to his dad, history, family. These were all three things that I wanted to make sure that I'd included in the book. Now, in the book, Savannah, she, I wanted her to face against some challenges, just like Robert Churchwell. They were a little different. She loses her dad. She learns the importance of loss and doing her best despite challenges. Today's children, they have a lot of challenges to face. It's no like walk in the park. I wanted Savannah to have something that kids could say, wow, that's, that's tragic. And this is what happens in the story, something tragic. Uh, her, her, da her dad dies in a car accident. Uh, she learns. She attends a school called Robert Churchwell Elementary because she has to move from her home in Chicago. She moves from Chicago to Nashville because her mother wants to be closer to her family after her husband's death. And this is a lot for Savannah to digest. But she goes to this school. It's called Robert Churchwell Elementary. And she learns about the man Robert Churchwell and other historic figures and moments in American history. Robert Churchwell, the man, and I could not have done a better job. Kevin, is, as you understand, being his, his um, son, he was able to just really give you an idea of, of the importance of education. Not only that his dad instilled, but his mom as well as a um, public school math teacher. Robert Churchwell, he grows up poor. He learns from his mom the importance of a, a good education. He works and he studies to become a better writer despite being bullied. He was bullied in school because of his writing, but he didn't let that stop him. He uses his gift um, for writing to provide a better life for his family. And as um, Kevin mentioned, he went to Fisk University. There were several pieces of um, history mentioned in the book, but there are three that I want to talk about today that have a connection, um, especially. That's Homer Plessy, Ruby Bridges, and Jackie Robinson. Homer Plessy, in 1892, he was 30 years old, he was a shoemaker, and um, he lived in New Orleans, and he was a, a fair-skinned African-American man. Um, at the time, things were different for blacks and whites. Um, blacks were in one car when he tra had to travel in the train cars. Um, the black train car was not as nice as the white train car, and he felt that this was wrong, so he challenged um, that whole thing about, I have to sit in the train car that is not as nice, he purposefully went to the uh, white train car, and because of his skin color, the person collecting the tickets thought, you know, he was white, and he informed him, no. He says, I'm, I'm an African-American, I'm a black man. And he was told that he needed to go to the blacks only section, and he refused. And he was found that that was to be unlawful. And it went to the Supreme Court in 1896. He lost his case in the separate but equal case, but he helped to move that whole conversation forward. Because in 1954, in Brown versus Board of Education, the Supreme Court found that separate but equal was unlawful. Now let's see how that has a connection with Ruby Bridges. From 1954, six years later, Ruby, Ruby Bridges attends um, a public school in, in New Orleans, and she is six years old, as I mentioned. It's an all-white public school. And as you can understand, this was part of that um, Brown versus Board of Education, it, uh, making, um, the, making us do what we were supposed to do in states. And so, long story short, New Orleans didn't want to do it, so they were, they were forced to do it. And this is what it was like for Ruby to go to school during that time. And Michael McBride, our award-winning art, artist, will talk a little bit more about that as far as the, the illustration. But this picture shows what it was like for Luke Ruby to attend school. And Jackie Robinson, as the mayor mentioned, 
had a, um, Robert Churchwell was, com was, was known as the Jackie Robinson of journalism. And I felt that this was really important for kids to know that this was Robert Churchwell and this was Jackie Robinson. I wasn't sure, I talked to Rob, um, Michael about this, but he created this wonderful picture that to me captures the essence of really what it was all about. He did an amazing job in doing that. Um, and I wanted the children to know that Jackie Robinson, as the mayor mentioned, was um, the first African-American to break the col color barrier in Major League Baseball. And that was in 1947. And three years later, Robert Churchwell in 1950 uh, broke the color barrier at the Nashville Banner by being an um, African-American journalist there. So, so that's why he was compared as the Jackie Robinson of journalism. And I wanted kids to make that connection because if you, if you lay it out for them, I think it's a little bit easier for them to understand as far as history. Family, of all the important um, pieces that were mentioned today, I think you would agree that family was most important to Robert Churchwell. And I actually heard him say many times when he would receive awards, he would always say that, you know, the most important award to me is my family. And that was so important to me. Sorry. I wanted to make sure that the book had family. And, and, and knowing that Savannah had a strong family, even though her dad was no longer there, I wanted to make sure that family was important. And that was really mentioned in the book. Um, in the story, Savannah, although she loses her mom, um, I mean her dad, her mom helps her to understand and learn that her dad's love will always be with her. Um, and she does that by sharing Robert Churchwell's inspirational story. Savannah remembers inspirational sayings from her dad. I sprinkle those inspirational sayings or nuggets throughout the book so that kids can remember that, you know, you can always keep your loved one in your mind through doing things that they enjoy or sayings, remembering those sayings, that kind of thing. And she learn, she lear, Savannah learns how to love her new school family. And she, she finds new, two new friends at her school, and that's Suni and Emily. Robert Churchwell, the man and family. As a child, he collected bones from trash cans uh, to help feed his family. And this showed the importance of family to, um, as far as Robert Churchwell. He didn't do this when he was older. He did it when he was younger as well. And as an adult, he, working at the Nashville Banner, you know, he had to put up with a lot of stuff. The mirror mentioned some of that. And that wasn't easy. But he did that because each day he knew he had his beautiful wife, of over 50 years, his five children, who he was very proud of, who were very accomplished. And at the time, he didn't know that because they were children, babies growing up. But he knew that if he provided a better life for them, a better opportunity, that they would be able to do wonderful things. And that's exactly what they did. So now we're going to have um, our award-winning ar artist, Michael McBride, to come up and talk about the illustrations. Thank you. Hello, it's uh, Michael McBride. Uh, it's tough coming behind two great, well, three great speakers, including the mayor, uh, and talk about the book. But I'm going to talk about it basically, the uh, illustration part. Give you a brief history about the illustration part. Um, James Threlkill and I share a studio together, and Gloria and Kevin and the family had commissioned us to do a mural for the Robert Churchwell School. Uh, to go in the library. And at that time, during that mural time, I learned a lot. I had knew some before, but I really learned a lot. And working with Kevin and Gloria was just absolutely fabulous. So after that project ended up being a success and all, she talked to James and I about illustrating a book. You know, she wanted to do a children's book. So we met and talked about it and um, got started. And when you have... Uh, two people illustrated, it's, it becomes a very interesting dynamic uh, because you have to decide how you're going to approach it. If one's going to do the covering, one's going to do the inside, or one's going to do background, one's going to do the imagery of people, you have to make all these decisions. And so we had made that decision. And uh, so James was going to do the illustration. I was going to handle the graphics in. I was going to do the cover and uh, do it that way. And as we got started, 
uh, James's job where he was working at uh, started commanding him to do more national stuff and traveling and all, and he really couldn't devote the time to the book, so Gloria came to me and uh, said she really wanted to continue if I would be willing to do it, so we kind of started from scratch <laughs> from the beginning and uh, started crafting this vision of, of the book and getting to know her and Kevin and getting to know her in the way of um, establishing a relationship, a good working chemistry relationship to bring about uh, a book, you know. And one of the things I always would tell Gloria, I said, it's always about the end result, what it's gonna look like in the end. I said, so that's what we're working for, the end result. Um, so we got started and went through and went through a lot of different uh, things. And, and in, in my process, my working process of doing illustrations is first spending time with the writer and we're talking about the vision and kind of the look and going over technical things and going over things about publishing and understanding what you want to do in the future, uh, whether you're going to head with the book, you know, not just do the book, but what's the whole vision and mission. And after we do that, then we go through and I go through and do illustrations based off as we go through the book, do raw illustrations, uh, ideas, thumbnail sketches, what we call them, about different things and different scenes. Because the thing that you learn as an illustrator is that you have to say a lot in one illustration. You got to tell a lot in one illustration. And so there's so many different ways you can do that. You can approach it in so many different ways in one illustration. So what you have to do is a lot of mental editing and decide which one is gonna be the best or the strongest. To, to give that message. And um, I guess I forgot how to work these clickers. I'm not <laughs> that good. And is one on the right or left? One on the right? Okay, all right. So what you see on, up, up at the top, uh, yeah, right there, uh, is a before idea. And you see notes on it and post-it notes on it. So Gloria being um, here and then moving, you know, when you have to move, we work through email and through uh, text messages and through <laughs> all these kinds of things and working ideas. So this sketch right here is one that James had done in the beginning. And uh, so we looked at it and we looked at it, we liked the idea. So this over here is the one, is the actual one that I did. Right there, that's the finished product, but that's kind of let you see what an idea is. And then this is the mural. That's, and if you've never been over to the Robert Churchwell uh, Elementary School, I urge you to go see this. It's a great mural in the library, and it's, it's really, it's, it, you know, I was very proud of that and very proud of, of working uh, with them. Uh, the second one, this is the idea. When Gloria and I are talking about that pink poster note, and what we decide is that we wanted you to see how the actual raw, you see notes, you see numbers, you see press notes, you see all of that. That's the way it works, you know? And so you can really see that she made these notes. And the idea, this one was very interesting because we talked a little bit about this because you wanted to show that, you said, you know, how are we gonna show this comparison and doing that as some way to put them in the same frame to make it look like, you know, that whole thing. And then I let you see the color that you see. That raw gray looking color was kind of done in such a way to exemplify during that time of black and white and newspapers. So you didn't see color in that. You always saw that black and white. So comparing that in the same time frame, so when kids would see that, they would understand it was the same time frame. It wasn't a different time frame. Uh, so that, that, that right there was the first, that was the first sketch. And then as you see right there's an end sketch. And what I do, you can illustrate, <laughs> in so many different media. You can illustrate in oil paintings, you can illustrate in watercolor, you can illustrate in pencil, you can illustrate in pen, you can illustrate in gouache, you can illustrate in block cuts. It's all a matter of the look that you want. And my preference I use is gouache, which is kind of an old medium because back in the 30s and 40s, if many of you have ever seen um, the great uh, artist that did the Great Migration, Jacob Lawrence, all of those paintings were done in gouache. So you understand that's really a medium that was done during that time, and I really fell in love with it um, because I'm a professor out of Tennessee State University, and I teach art, so I teach illustration. So I teach working in different mediums and stuff. 
Um, and then this one right here you see um, is the idea for the whole uh, Ruby Bridges kind of uh, thing. Now, one of the things, one of the greatest things that has happened for us as illustrators is the internet. Internet and Google. I tell you the truth. It's one of the best, I'm telling you, if they had had that year back in the 30s and 40s, I mean, it could be incredible work. Because what it does is that we were taught in school in the, in the 70s about having as an illustrator because it's about time, speed, and you don't have time to sit and ponder like you're doing oil painting. Well, let me think on this three days. and do, You don't have that. You have to have what we call a working file. And so now Google has become the working file. You can get it, download it, throw it, file it, go back to it. I mean, you can just pick up everything that you wanted. So I was going through research and looks, you know, and images of that time. You know, how do you put that together? So that right there is, is a rough idea. Glory, we would look, she would look at something like that. And if she had suggestions, we'd talk about it, whatever. Then I would go and do that's the full idea. And then this one, um, the, the one, the Plessy uh, case. As you see, all these notes on there and stuff. That was the first sketch. We looked at it. We actually did a, uh, and I don't know if I have it, but we actually, remember, I actually did a color. We did a color in, rendering from that. But then she looked at it, and she looked at it, and we talked about it. She said, it's not quite giving me you know, what I want. So we went back to the drawing board, and then we came up with that. And it's still a few notes, you know. And so it, it, I think it got the vision of what she wanted it to be so people could see who Plessy was, what he looked like. You tell a child about something, and they go, well, what did he look like? <laughs> you know, so they had a chance to see that. And that's it for me. And I think now it's time for your entertainment. is um, Alexandria and Briard. They were, I just wanted to mention this because this is a really important piece. We have teachers in the audience and we, we know that children learn differently and sometimes they can, you can read something to them or they could read something that really doesn't stick. But if they hear a, a music, a rhythm, there's something associated with it, they can remember that and then they can help, it helps them to understand the readings a little bit easier. So Briard and Alexandria, they were so kind to help me with this project because we wanted to make sure we had the musical piece to be able to um, introduce that to kids and helping them to learn about Robert Churchwell. And so they, they'll, they'll tell you the rest, but Alexandria wrote all the words to the songs and she sings the songs and Briart wrote all the music. So basically, between these two creative individuals, I mean, we, we got something more than we bargained for and we, we thank them for that. So now I'll turn it over to them. Thank you for the introduction, mother. <laughs> so, hi. <laughs> my, my name's Alexandria Churchwell, and as my mom said, I am the lyricist and singer for the Robert Churchill Writing News Making History album, and I'm a rising junior at New York University Tisch. And I'm Briard Huggins. Thank you, Ms. Glory, for that incredible introduction. Um, I, too, am a rising junior at College Conservatory of Music at the University of Cincinnati, and we'd like to once again welcome you to Robert Churchwell Day at the National Public Library. I'm the composer as well as the producer for the album. So today we're just gonna briefly talk about the creation of the album and our personal roles in it as well. And this all began when my mother approached me and asked if, if I had any interest of in possibly making a theme song for Savannah Green because she thought, you know, children reading a book, it's very helpful, they're able to learn that way, but especially this day and age with like ADHD and all of the other ways that children learn. Music is another way for children to actually obtain information. So I was like, of course I'll help. And so then she also asked me if I knew anyone to compose the music for the theme song. So I agreed to write it. And then I thought of my friend Briard to actually compose the music. Yeah, Miss Gloria um, actually emailed me last summer. And she's like, hey, so I'm working on this children's book series. And I was wondering if you would like to compose the music to the theme song. And the theme song would basically highlight Savannah as a character. And she also told me I'd be working with my best friend Alex here. And so I was like, so yeah, I definitely will you know, we'll do it because I get to work with Alex again and work with the wonderful Churchwell family. And so um, after many 
much time in the studio and ins and outs, trials and errors, it's been crazy. The theme song was done and I had never done children's music before. Like I'm a primary jazz writer, so this was something totally different. So I thought, and why not? It's you know a fun challenge to take on. So <laughs> we did it. So the theme song was finally complete. Yeah, but then we thought, why would we just stop there? Because we've created just this great product with the theme song and, and giving us Savannah a voice. With, and my mom thought, why not go further with that? And so she called upon Briard and I again, asking if we'd actually create an album for the entire book, see, for uh, writing news, making history, Savannah Green series. And so we're like, of course, so we'll help with that. And so what you saw, come, what you heard coming in was actually the full album. It's five songs for the entire book. And it, com it encompasses like the major themes from the book. Yeah, and the major themes of the book are um, you know, making friends, um, the, great the Great Depression, <laughs> nope, um, dealing with the loss. <laughs> Doing your best and the um, discrimination, and um, that's what I think. Those are the most important themes I think that are discussed in the book. Those are the most important themes that kids need to learn when they're reading the book, and then they can also learn them now through music and through song, because people learn differently, as Alex was saying. Um, and the last song on the album is actually called 1917, and it's a tribute to Robert Churchwell, the man of the hour, the man behind the pen, as we like to say. Um, and it really just sums up his legacy of what he did and his contributions that he made. Um, so now we are going to perform three songs yes. for you. And the three songs we're going to sing are Just Say Hi, With Me, and 1917, as we already said, was the tribute. And it's actually on the back of your program, all the lyrics to 1917, but we'll get to that. <laughs> just, just foreshadowing. <laughs> and so like I said before, I'm the, I'm the lyricist and I write all the lyrics to the songs on the album. And what the process, that kind of process is I'll write, I'll just go down right in my room, just I'll think of the themes like, okay, I'll just write a few lyrics down. And then I hand them over to Briard and he'll either like tweak them because he creates a melody for the song. And then he may take some lyrics out just to make it flow with the music because sometimes it can get a bit wordy. So adding like a bunch of words, especially for children's music, you want to make it simple and sweet and like nice and simple. So he helps me with that. And the entire process, it can go on for a few hours on end, especially with me being a little perfectionist, but it's okay. I want to get it right. She is. <laughs> so, she is. But yeah. usually we have a tight time frame. So we'll usually get the track done, with the, the entire album done within a week's time. So now for some singing. I'm sure you guys are very excited. We'll just mosey on over to the... <laughs> so the first song we're going to sing is Just Say Hi. And this is, deals with the theme of friendship. And when I was writing it, I was thinking, okay, so what does it really mean to be a friend? Like, what, do, what are some things you guys think when you think of friendship? Any words, like phrases? Anyone have any suggestions? This is interactive. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone? Anyone? Daddy, what do you think? Like, what do you think, when you hear friendship, what do you think of? Oh, confident, perfect. Someone you can confide in. Loyalty. Connections, very nice. Anyone else? Fun. Having fun, exactly. So those are some great examples. So I, I was just thinking that too. I was like, okay, so when you think of a friendship, you think of someone that you want to hang out with and there's your best buddy and also, but then I was thinking, okay, so how does a friendship start? And where does that come from? Like, what is the basis of a friendship? And I was thinking, oh, you just say hi to someone. That's where it all begins. So this is what, there's, this, is what this song came from, just, just say hi. And I hope you enjoy it. Strive for what's 
Thank you. And that's one of our favorite ones. It's always spunky and fun, and we always like performing it, don't we, Alex? Yes. <laughs> um, so the next song we're going to sing for you is called With Me, and I think this song is so monumental in terms of the story. And when I was writing the music for it, I was like, okay, we need something big, because Miss Gloria came to me, and she said, so this song is supposed to deal with, you know, deal with the loss, talk about dealing with the loss, talk about remembrance, and this song is, in, is written in tribute to Savannah's dad, and Savannah is singing this song in you know, honoring her dad, saying that you know, he'll still be with her you know, wherever she goes. And it's so moving because it, if you think about it, it sets in motion the entire Savannah series because we know, you know she loses her dad in the, in the story and that results in her move to Nashville and her move to new school, making new friends, all these other things we see having to Savannah is a result of that loss. And sometimes, you know, as we said, it, it takes an unfortunate event to bring out a better tomorrow for you. And we never would know Savannah if it wasn't for this loss because she never would have done the things that she does. So. Without further ado, hope you enjoy our with me. I close my eyes. I see dad smile, he turns to me and says, Savannah, I'll be gone for a while. I nod and say, okay. I'm busy not giving him the time of day. I know that something's wrong when I see mommy cry. She tries to hold back tears, but they don't want to
our final song, I'm going to need a little help from you guys. As we said, it's called 1917, and it's a tribute to the man himself, Robert Churchwell. So if you want to turn over your programs, you'll see the lyrics there. Don't worry, it's a lot of lyrics, a bit intimidating. But right now, I'm just going to teach you guys the chorus, so when that time comes, I'm going to point to you guys, and you can help me sing along with it. If you don't get it the first time, it happens four times, so we'll do this together. It's going to be great. So <laughs> if you want to repeat after me, I'm gonna, I'll teach you guys the chorus. So it goes... Robert Churchwell, the man behind the pin. Okay, can you guys do that for me? Okay, five, six, seven, eight. Robert Churchwell, the man behind the pin. Beautiful. Lovely. That was amazing. <laughs> and then the second part goes, Robert Churchwell, your legacy never ends. So same melody. Really simple, just different words. Okay, five, six, seven, eight. Robert Churchwell, your legacy never ends. Great, so that's just the chorus, really simple. So let's just put it all together just to make sure we all have it. Say, ready? Five, six, seven, eight. Robert Churchwell, the man behind the pen. Robert Churchwell, your legacy never ends. Very nice, give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> okay, great. So we're going to sing 1917. The song starts off with a chant, so it's just spelling Robert Churchill's name. You'll kind of get the gist of it once you hear it. But feel free to clap along and sing along. So I hope you enjoy 1917. Okay. Back in 1917, a star is born. He went through struggles like none can compare. The Great Depression, both were worse. But everything changed when he picked up that pen, hoping one day all hate would end. The words he'd write would ignite a light. The words he'd write would bring nonfiction to life. Robert Churchwell. Churchwell, your legacy never ends, your legacy never ends. Through the ups and through the downs, he was a family man. He was a husband, a team with his wife, taught his five children to work hard in life. Discouraged by many, encouraged by few, struggled like all the great heroes do. Now it's time to pass on his dream. Everybody, everywhere, join his team. Robert Churchwell, the man behind the pen. Robert Churchwell, your legacy never ends. Your legacy never ends. Your legacy never ends. Your legacy never ends. Here we go. R-O-B-E-R-T-C-H-U-R-C-H-W-E-L-L. Robert Churchwell. Okay. Thank you. I'm just going to pass it over to my parents for one last announcement. Thank you, Alexander and Briard. They were amazing, weren't they? Thank you. You really makes it, you make it fun, and kids want to learn and know more about the man Robert Churchwell. And they're also learning about their American history, so that's wonderful. So that's great. Thank you. Okay, Kevin has one more story, and then we're going to wrap it up. <laughs> so I just had one more story just to give the kids proof that Robert Churchill was a superhero. So you remember that all superheroes have secret identities and they have secret powers that they only bring out when they need to. So here's the example of him having secret powers that he only brought out when he needed to. So uh, when uh, my brother and I went to uh, college, uh, my, brother, my twin brother Keith went to a school that uh, required a foreign language. He had to take one. I didn't have to take a foreign language. That was pretty good for me. So uh, he, the foreign language he decided to take was French. And so uh, he comes home, and we're actually at church uh, on a Sunday. Uh, and uh, church ends, and we go outside. And uh, my, Robert Churchill, my dad, goes up to him and says, OK, you've been taking French. OK, so let's hear some French. And uh, he's terrible, OK? <laughs> but he's, he gives him a little French. You know, he starts speaking. 
And then uh, my dad turns to him, turns to him, and starts to speak eloquently in French. So my brother Keith and I look at each other and say, "Superhero, there you go." <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. That's a great story. As we we know that besides every wonderful man, there's a wonderful woman, and we have a wonderful woman with us today, who's our superhero, our female superhero, and that's Mary Churchwell. And we have a little gift for you today just to recognize you and all that you're doing and standing behind that man and make him wonderful because you're a wonderful woman. We want you to come on up. We have some roses for you just to say that we love you and thank you. Say a few words. Did you want to say? I'm like, no, dear. I just want to say. Okay. Thank you, Mom. I want to say thank you for the beautiful flowers. Oh, you're so sweet. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming. We really appreciate your being here, and we have um, a, a, a reception for you um, outside, and we also have books if you want to buy any books and music as well, and a nice, beautiful poster that um, our illustrator. Uh, put together for us. So we thought for the teachers, if you wanted to bring some back into your classrooms, that kind of thing. So thanks again for coming. It really means a lot. We appreciate you. Thank you.